Um, my name's John Hawkins. I'm an arable farmer. I'm a tenant. And I've only been back on the family farm as an AHA tenant uh, since I was 30. So prior to that, um, I did a degree in maritime studies, um, joined the Royal Navy as an officer, worked with the Royal Marines in a number of particularly unpleasant parts of the world, and um, was a consultant in security in a little town called Baghdad. And I suddenly went, I think I'd like to go home and get into farming now. So... Um, the pay cut was miserable, especially as you have to qualify for a tenancy. So general farmer worker grade two was my title. Uh, but it's, it's been a great journey. Um, so I've been at home farming now for 14 years and just starting to put the picture together and have a better understanding. The great thing about it, though, was I think I came home with um, a much broader view on how we as farmers are influenced by global behaviours. Um, and national behaviours, and then when you get down to deep, dark Dorset, uh, it's very easy to be inward-looking and quite introvert about your own little piece of England that you may manage, own, or farm. Um, so it, it's important, and Groundswell's brilliant for this. It's so important to think outside the box, take yourself away, and regenerate your mind, and come back and implement some ideas. And I think that's what we want to try and share with you today. There's lots of great people, and many of them are here at Groundswell, who four or five years ago, you just pick up all their good ideas, put them together for yourself to make your business run and pay your bills. Um, and it's a pleasure to be asked here to, and, and Tim's helped me on that journey, um, to share, share with you all some of that. So Tim, over to you. Uh, hello everyone, Tim Stevens. I'm a catchment advisor working for Wessex Water in uh, various projects looking to reduce nitrogen, phosphorus, sediment and pesticides in drinking water and um, uh, other water environments. Uh, I work with farmers um, usually one-to-one. -one. John is someone I've been working with since 2015. And yes, I'm going to talk a little bit about nitrate leaching in the context of John's farm and locality. And we've got some drone footage of John's farm to hopefully pictures tell a thousand words. And John will then talk more in more detail about what he's doing and why. He's changed his farming system quite radically in the last few years and I'm going to talk about what the impact of that has been on nitrate leaching in our local borehole and in Pool Harbour. So in a moment, there's going to be some images come up of Pool Harbour in Dorset. It's got all sorts of international designations uh, as an important wetland, and it suffers from excessive algal growth as a result of uh, mainly nitrates coming down the rivers Froome and Piddle, uh, most of that nitrate is thought to come from agriculture, but there's an element as well coming from wastewater treatment, uh, i.e. Wessex Water Sewage Treatment Works. So, Pool Harbour is an interesting case study because I think it, it is paving the way for where a lot of other water-sensitive catchments are going, in that there's been calls for it to be designated a water protection zone, which would be NVZ++++, um, and fortunately, though, the NFU have led a farmer, uh, a farmer initiative to come up with a voluntary alternative. So John is farming in both a Wessex Water borehole catchment and in the wider Pool Harbour catchment. So he's got pressure to reduce nitrate leaching from his farm from both of those angles. The overall value, the overall amount of nitrogen coming into Pool Harbour is thought to be about 2,000 tonnes a year. And that's from four or 500 farms. And the Environment Agency in Natural England think that that needs to come down to about 1,200 tonnes for the eutrophication to be reversed. And so what farmers in this part of Dorset are faced with now is calculating their nitrate leaching uh, using a tool and then being set targets to reduce that. So 
I'll talk a bit more about what we think John's nitrate losses are in a moment. Is it, is it just starting now? I'm going to try and keep pace with, uh, with, with the film um, as I talk. So just to explain a bit about John's locality, John is farming on chalk downland. Um, it's rolling, so you've got s some sloping uh, chalk where the depth of the topsoil is quite thin. Um, and then you've got some clay cap. And what we're trying to do is work with farmers to improve nitrogen use efficiency. And we'll talk a bit about some of the practices uh, that we are encouraging farmers to adopt uh, in a moment. The borehole that John is in the source protection zone of supplies up to 8 million litres of water a day. It unfortunately though is out of supply for between three and six months a year due to these elevated nitrates. And what we're trying to do is reduce the increasing trend in nitrate. You can see it now. Um, you've got Pool Harbour away in the uh, far left. You've got uh, the valley here running down to the, the borehole at Melbourne St Andrew. And John's farm is basically underneath the drone here. Um, but this is a major operational challenge for a water company uh, losing a key source uh, that can produce that volume of water. Uh, for that number of months. So we're trying to reduce the trend that's um, still going up, but we're also trying to uh, uh, cap those spikes that we get after heavy rainfall through the winter. And these wetter winters that we're seeing uh, don't help that effort. But of course, it isn't just agriculture that's contributing to, our, uh, to this algal growth in Pool Harbour. Uh, wastewater treatment as well. And so Wessex Water has been investing in its sewage treatment works to reduce the amount of nitrate that's going uh, down the rivers and into Pool Harbour. But we're also working with farmers uh, to help them reduce their nitrate concentrations. The alternative to what we're doing, catchment management, is to install nitrate removal. And in a moment, well, yes, here, you'll see the water treatment works right below the drone there. And basically, what we're trying to avoid is having to install uh, ion exchange nitrate plants, which for this sort of uh, source would cost about £5 million in capital investment, probably a quarter of a million pounds a year to run. It's very energy intensive, so it doesn't do our carbon footprint any good. And it also produces a useless product at the end. It produces a briny solution that has to go into the sewage treatment works. So we do think the nitrate trends will head in the right direction eventually, but because of the geology there with this deep chalk and the water moving down through, carrying the nitrates with it about a, a meter to two meters a year, we can see it being many decades before some of that nitrate flushes through the system. So although there's a lot of nitrate that's due to, to historic practice, our fathers and grandfathers, there's also an element of uh, current practice that's contributing to that. In a moment, you're going to see some footage of the sorts of changes John has made to the farm. Um, as I said, it's been quite significant. Uh, half the farm, uh, well, the whole farm is entered into a countryside stewardship scheme and half the farm pretty much in a legume fallow and then half the farm in a spring crop, cropping and cover crop rotation, which John will explain in more detail. Um, but where we would start with a farmer who we're talking to about reducing nitrate leaching is, uh, first of all, helping them make the most of the schemes and funding that's on offer uh, already, typically countryside stewardship. And so John's a really good example of someone who's been really strategic about 
uh, take into account all the, the local factors um, and choosing the stewardship measures accordingly. The next thing is looking at the 5 to 10% of the farm uh, that's got the poorest nitrogen utilization efficiency. And so in John's case, that was field corners. It was the steeper bits where the uh, chalk is closest to the surface. And so working with farmers, looking at yield maps and identifying alternative uses for that. Now, you can see the legume fallow uh, left and right of the hedge, but up ahead you've got some reed canary grass. And that's a section of a field that was an arable cross cropping that John put into reed canary grass for five years. That produces a useful byproduct uh, for his biomass boiler. But it does also give us a big water quality benefit. We've had porous pots in there monitoring the nitrate leaching. And the nitrate leaching on, in that has been down under five kilos of nitrogen per hectare per year. And that just illustrates the value of a perennial over an annual crop. The rooting really does make a big difference. And of course, it's a zero input crop as well. But um, the next big change a farmer can make uh, to reduce nitrate leaching is looking at the rotation. And here you've got some fields that John has just drilled up with spring barley when this drone went over. And spring cropping has a number of advantages for, for us as a water company when you compare it to winter cropping. Generally, the spring crops have a lower nitrogen and input requirement. And secondly, they offer us an opportunity to grow a cover crop before. And the, the, all the monitoring that we've done of nitrate leaching, because um, this is all about leaching in these sorts of soil types. Yes, in really bad weather, you'll get some surface runoff, carry some sediment and probably a bit of nutrient with it. But in these very permeable uh, landscapes, it's all about nitrate leaching. And so the, 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 the monitoring that we do of the nitrate leaching uh, gives us some really good indication of what practices work and what doesn't. And we've had that going since about 2008. So we've built up some really long-term data sets. The porous pots um, are a useful tool and what they've told us is that John's average rotation, ro rotational leaching, rather than looking at an individual crop in a particular year, but if you average it out across a, a four-year rotation, is down to around 12 to 15 kilos of nitrogen per hectare per year leached. And just to put that in context, that is against an environment agency target for Pool Harbor farmers uh, of 18.3, I think it is, kilos per hectare across all land uses. Um, and we, we didn't have porous pots in John's farm 20 years ago when he was in a, a more intensive rotation, more winter cropping, uh, a lot of poultry manure use. But I'd be confident that his leaching was up above 50 kilos back then per hectare. Um, by about 2015, when he was 50% winter cropping, 50% spring, starting to grow cover crops, I think he got down to the mid-30s. But um, it is a challenge getting down from the, the mid-30s into the, into the teens. Um, and so this Pool Harbour farmer-led initiative is um, trying to help farmers quantify where they are at the moment and then work out what they need to do to get there. So these next few images are about the sorts of uh, things John is doing uh, machinery wise um, and what I like about working with John is that he's not afraid to trial and error um, and what I try to do with the, the water company uh, support we can give him is to give him data so he knows whether it's sort of having a net, impact, a net benefit to water quality or carbon, but also we can offer some funding for the things that Countryside Stewardship isn't funding so that he can um, have, have the confidence to try different things. Um, I would just say on nitrogen rates, John is really reducing his nitrogen rates a lot. Um, and cover crops and things are okay, but they're not actually... Um, reducing the amount of nitrogen that goes into the system unless you make the adjustments uh, for what nitrogen they're releasing. And so John's soil biology, uh, you know, 
firing much better now and improving nutrient cycling and making a difference to the availability of those nutrients, enabling him to, to cut back on rates. So really just in conclusion, John's just topping up some uh, clover into the legume fallow here in the, in the patches. But in conclusion, what's John doing that we, you know, we would encourage others to do? It's looking at uh, avoiding bare soil wherever possible to build soil carbon um, and act as a buffer uh, for that water and that nitrate as it passes through the soil profile. That slows the flow of water through the landscape. And, and thirdly, he's looking to manage nitrogen differently and um, improve that nutrient cycling within the soil. And on that note, I will hand over to John. Um, thank you, Tim. That's a good intro. And it, it gives you an idea that people can sow a seed in your mind, not just in the ground, and then you can build upon that. So we're all very good at reacting in farming. You know, the wheat price is quite high at the moment. What do you think everyone in the world's going to do? Plant some more. Do you think the wheat price will be high next year? No. But it's so tempting to be drawn into quick fix solutions in farming. Uh, and that's what we used to do. You know, we, we'd, we had a set rotation, all seed rape, followed by winter wheat, followed by two spring barleys, and the neighbours did the same, and they still do the same. And they'll give you just enough profit if you average your rotation out over four or five years to keep you in business, pay your bills, pay your rent, and then repeat the process. That's fine, except we're all being crushed on price increasing now. So you all know our overheads are going up and up and up, and I don't really see the average commodity price going up proportionally. Then the government are taking our subsidy money away the direct payments. I mean, that's been used and abused, I'm afraid. It was only ever a weather insurance. And of course, now all of your inputters, we'll call them, uh, take a little cut of that money um, before you even take the risk of growing your crop in our wonderful British weather that's so reliable. So, so we plugged on for quite a while. Um, we used big six meter cultivators and a big Vardastat repeat drill and a 285 horsepower New Holland tractor. And um, we reached a point where I was working seven days a week with a young child, and I thought, I'm not earning any money here after I've paid my rent. I'm really not willing to keep investing large amounts of money into depreciating kit. Um, and I can't really see a point where maybe at 65 I could go, I'm going to retire and buy a house and have a pension. And I think some of you who are farmers are feeling a bit like that at the moment. Um, I don't see very many people taking the government's retirement pot because it's pretty bad, actually. So if you do take it, I'm sure it's in relation to other plans, etc. cetera. Um, what we've done is flown across the whole farm for the last six months, and every month um, we've taken a clip and built it in. And unfortunately, Groundswell required my video a month ago, so actually it's looking really good now, but I'm not trying to hide. You're seeing every field I farm. I've got nothing to hide here. Visually, making that transition to a no-till, regenerative, whatever you want to call it, approach, looks awful. You know, that's, that's why everyone does recreational tillage, because your initial crop looks fantastic, doesn't it? All beautiful lines. Um, but what really we're, I want to discuss with you is the economics. You know, if you carry on on a... We're a 240-hectare farm. People go, that's a big farm. Well, it's not. At the moment, you need a 400-hectare farm in order to justify one full-time member of staff. That is the hard economics. So what do I do? Go and get a part-time job? Of course I haven't got time to do that. I've got to do all the maintenance, the accounts, pay the bills, you name it. You, you know that you're not just a farmer who sits in a tractor. And as Jeremy Clarkson's shown us, that's the fun bit. Um, getting up there with your plowmans on a sunny day is great. Um, so did I go and rent more land? Of course not. I'll get outbidded on every single bit of land around me. I'm not also going to go and work for fun. So all these FBTs are, are great for the landlord, but they're not particularly funny for the tenant farmer. And yes, if you own your own land, you could probably go rent a bit and average it out. That wasn't an option as, option as a tenant. Um, I'm certainly not in a position to buy land, and if those of you that are lucky you, but it's, it's disproportionate to what you can earn from it to about the value of taking 60 years to pay off 
if you farm it well every year for 60 years and get an average price, you'll pay off the value of that land at today's prices. Um, hence why getting a mortgage on a house for 25 years is, or buying an industrial unit is probably, unless you're trying to avoid tax for inheritance, it's probably as good a bet as anything. It's why everyone doesn't run out and buy land. But farmers are great at thinking that's the solution. And well done you if your land price doubles over 10 years, by the way, but it's, it's a bit like a mortgage. What could go up could go down. Um, so this is what we're doing. We're taking our productive areas uh, and leaving them in these rotations. And everyone goes, oh, you're doing rewilding. And the answer is, no, I'm not. Um, every single meter of our farm over five years is being farmed. Um, and they go, oh, that's a clever idea. How did you come up with that? The answer is history when we were kids. Um, they taught us about the medieval field fallow system, the free field fallow system. That's all I'm actually doing here. It's just what's so sad is I found it's more profitable not to grow all seed rape. Well, a lot of people might agree with me on that one. And not to grow winter wheat on my light soils because they're high input, high output crops. Uh, and if you don't get it right, you're going to be out of pocket. It's a very fine line between a really profitable harvest with those winter crops and a loss. Um, and I, I'm not claiming we're good farmers or bad farmers. We're diligent. We're definitely timely. You know, I'm not going to leave crops standing in the field. But you get under quite a large amount of pressure, uh, and you certainly can't budget ahead to next year. And you've taken that gamble 18 months in advance in some cases as to whether you'll get paid what you think you deserve for your efforts. Um, and that's why I think to get a guaranteed income... It's quite nice. The BPS isn't guaranteed, as I said before. They've already had that off you in the 18 months up to you selling your crop. Um, but if the government are going to offer you a bit more, I'd like to see them offer a little bit more money than they currently offer all the mid-tier options. But um, my internet failed in 2017 over Christmas. So being a really sad git, I printed off the 800 pages of the mid-tier stewardship. I just read through it all. And that's why I came up with this mixture of options and then compared them to what I could earn between now and January 2023 from sticking with that old rotation. And did some maths, handed it to my dad, who's 75 and is still a partner, but has backed down, who's done it in that traditional way for a long time. He couldn't argue with the maths. It, it was just simple accounting. I'm not an accountant. It was add it all up over five years, divide it by your area, and we all get paid to the square meter now, or we certainly have to claim to the square meter. So I went, okay, let's do it on a square meter basis. Let's take a basic payment scheme, which was 230 pounds, and is getting worse every day from now on. Add on to it your mid-tier payments. Add on to it projects you might want to get involved in. You know, for you, you might want to do glamping. I want to do nitrogen reduction with the water company. So you can add on a certain element of money there. I've just sold my carbon credits. Well, I haven't yet because they have to be verified after harvest. But that's money for old rope. Go and get some grants for bits of kit. Um, I went out and got a grant for that Aitchison Simtech drill. I'm not on their sales team, but I'm told by the people who sell wearing parts that they're one of those most popular drills being sold currently over the last few years. It's a really simple drill. It's replaced my Vardastat Rapide. And I used to spend most of my time underneath that wretched thing fixing it because we live in Dorset and we have these things called Dorset diamonds that basically shatter steel. Um, and I'd spend more time underneath it on a cold February morning fixing it than I would be doing the actual drilling because when it worked, it was really quick. But th this has removed all of that. And, and that is a two-and-a-half-year-old grass. You've just seen it on the imagery. This is really quite mad. Everyone was like, that won't work. You, you can't direct drill straight into two and a half years of fallow, having sprayed it off a month before. But um, it has worked, which is really quite cool. I've used six litres of um, diesel per hectare to do that. And it's all auto steer, so I'm probably drinking a cup of tea. Or Badger there is doing the driving. Um, you cover about two hectares an hour, so it's not all quick and halfway. You know that feeling when you're halfway across a field and you're like, I want to be nearer the headland, the other side. But you, you just have to do your, do your business. You know, I, I can check my emails, ring people. Um, and 
crop goes in the ground. I think when we drilled that, it had been raining heavily for about a month and had stopped raining about two days beforehand. Now, okay, I'm on sort of boy's ground, but that's quite clayey where Dad's just doing a bit of leisure rolling just for the camera. Um, you don't have to roll it, but it's, a, it's not a bad thing to do. Um, and that's it. Oh, and you're thinking, and, and please, in a minute, you ask any question you like um, once we've finished the, the film bit. But um, that establishment of that home save barley, it, it, it was propino, has cost next to nothing, really. I mean, ignore the fancy tractor, that's quite expensive, but I lease that at the moment, so it's all quantified. Um, and I can get through the orchard trees a bit more easily now. The Vardastat repeat at six meters with belt markers was quite hard work. Um, in there, I'm just planting some wild bird food because the irony is you get paid more to feed birds than you do to feed human beings at the moment. Um, that isn't really right, is it? You know, uh, 639 quid a hectare for wild bird food, and that's all I do is home save and mix it up and punch it in and walk away. And we have a look, you'll see it in a minute, but we have an awful lot more wildlife. So that's my agroforestry. That, those are cherry trees. They've been there for 14 years. That was a little project I did thinking that organic cherries would be really valuable. Uh, and then a big fruit grower in Kent planted about a million trees the year after. And I was like, oh, great. So we made some cherry brandy and we made some cherry juice and we bought some cherry machinery and tried to add value and lost a fortune, quite honestly. It was lovely juice, lovely brandy. But, um, I even got into the alcohol industry and realized that by the time you've paid £28.22 a litre in tax for spirits, you might as well give it up, you know. Unless you're Diageo, where you can put a bottle of vodka on the shelf for 13 quid, and it's like, how do you do the maths there? They're making about 10 pence a, a bottle profit. Um, so, it's, yeah, I'm not being cynical, and if you do want to go out and add value to what you do, good luck. Um, I just, yeah, it was fun. I think, I think that was the privilege, was to get to play with something as lovely as an organic cherry and make it into great things and meet people was, was fun, but it doesn't pay the bills. And it was, again, another trigger that made me realise how undervalued our food and drink is. So, you go to a food fair... And someone who's worked really hard all week will spend 20 quid. They'll take 20 quid with them to the food fair and they'll buy something really nice. And as soon as they get home, they'll get their 99p loaf of bread and feed the family on that for the rest of the week. So I think that's a real shame. Um, I don't think, well, I think most of you would agree, we're not really being supported as a farming industry at the moment until food prices rise. And that is a discussion nobody's willing to have. So you're thinking, oh, well, you'll do all this, and then the food price will go up, and you'll regret it. It's got to go up quite a lot more before I'm going to regret taking government support to do wilding or wildlife work. But don't think for a moment I wouldn't go and buy a plough and in a time of conflict or some strategic emergency, I'd be willing to feed my nation within about six months. That isn't what they wanted to do at the moment. And if I was one of the buyers, I'd probably would be wanting to buy Ukrainian wheat, um, substantially cheaper than we can grow it. Because actually its nutritional density is pretty good still. Their, their soils haven't been beaten for 70 years, only about 20 so far. They're getting on the treadmill. They're smashing it to bits now and it will degrade. But it's that's my competition, isn't it? Ukrainian wheat and... Uh, Canadian canola uh, and barley from wherever. Um, it, it's quite hard when my whole farm is the size of one of their little fields. Uh, and you, you all have this feeling, unless you're lucky. Um, we like to do innovative stuff. The great thing at the moment is this chat about hedges. And I don't know where it's going, but hedges are such a uh, elusive subject, you know, do you leave them for seven years, do you cut them every other year? We cut them every other year. I love operating two bits of kit at once too. That's a front mower, rear baler, and I'm just baling up some of my reed canary grass biomass. Reed canary grass is fine if you've got a use for it. Um, I'd rather uh, grow a perennial cereal crop than that. Something like Kenza, if you've heard of it, which um, 
no seed company in their right mind will allow us to commercialize because you plant it once and, and harvest it every year for five years. Um, and it locks down vast amounts of carbon. I mean, really. You, so you get paid for that too. Um, so this system's great. Uh, we, we are, we've still got a normal combine. That header I lift right up and I make sure nothing lodges and I just take the heads off and all the other organic matter is going straight back into the ground. Um, I grow a little bit of my own straw, but I also buy it in from other sources for our biomass boiler. That's primarily for our grain dryer. Uh, that was quite a windy day. Um, and um, that's changed what we can do. I can go out with 30% moisture in my barley and harvest it and dry it. Or I can go out and get specialist grains and dry them. Whereas before, I was worried witless about will it rain, won't it rain, it's going to cost me two, three pounds for every percentage of moisture I've got to remove. So that, that's opened up a new opportunity for us. Biomass and energy is not farming though, as you all know. It's an entirely different diversification project. The, this is a flu scrubber, so this is our attempt to save the planet. We are scrubbing CO2, that's carbon in the tank that we're washing out. It's just something I learned on merchant ships. It's what the merchant navy do when they're hauling your grain around the world, is they scrub it, they dump it in the sea, I dump it onto my green waste compost, and hopefully reapply it to the living plants in the field. Um, it's closing cycles, it's closing those loops down, and hopefully making a little bit more money in the process. The more companies can open up the loops, the more they'll earn from you. And the wider they force your rotation, the more they'll take off you. Um, that is just simple economics. Uh, and then the wildlife. Um, I've been very lucky. The, the lad, Tom, who brought his drone along and has been filming the farm, and it's going to continue to do so. So every month from now on, we're just going to keep building that story and picture. Is also an exceptionally good wildlife photographer. And um, all of these shots he's taken on the farm. We used to have a bit of wildlife. Um, every farmer can claim that, can't they? Um, but the reason the government's paying me a mid-tier fundamentally is to d develop environmental benefit. Uh, they're not paying it to me to grow food, and they're not really paying it to me to protect groundwater, but they are to a, a small degree. Um, the explosion in the wildlife of just putting the whole farm into what I call a lily pad. Most of you have heard of cluster groups, which is a number of farmers all do a little bit to create a cluster. If all your neighbors don't choose that route, but you choose to turn your whole farm into what I call a lily pad, all of your wildlife is going to cross over onto their farms and back again. So it's a bit naughty, and if any of my direct neighbors listen to this, they'll probably be cross, but I've just taken their environmental money because they didn't want it. But we're having this assessed all the time, and we are still delivering because wildlife doesn't respect um, boundaries an output over the whole area um, and we're at maximum densities of things like skylarks and corn buntings um, along the line that's a nice noise isn't it a lot of diesel um, we're sort of delivering on a rotational basis similar kind of outputs to these wilded countryside parks and um, it's pretty um, it's pretty pleasing actually that if the public money for the public good is why I'm being paid, well, it's delivering. Um, that's their benefit, not mine. Um, but but we've, we've got massive increases in, and we're surveying this all the time, uh, not just birds. Birds are the obvious one. They're the most visual one. But the insects, the beneficial insect life has gone through the roof. Um, the number of bees sat on my vetch today, or on a sunny day, the, everything, 240 hectares is humming with the sound of solitary bees operating. I was a bit shocked when I first saw that and heard it, and I went, wow, that's, that's pretty cool. And we've always had honeybees for the orchards, but um, a lot of people are allowed to just go and top it. If you'd topped it, you wouldn't have all that uh, bee activity. And if that's pollinating my neighbor's oilseed rape, great, I'm happy. Um, what else is there? Because of the high stubbles, because of the relay cropping, where I love relay cropping, by the way. Um, it's where we've always got something going into the ground. Um, 
before we harvest. So if there's a nice wet period coming up in the next few weeks before harvest, instead of twiddling my thumbs and not going on holiday this year, I shall be out there with the fertilizer spinner whacking on my cover crop to get it going. It's a gamble, it might fail, but if you haven't spent a lot of money on your seed, you probably can't afford to take that risk and get it going rather than pay to tillage it in post-harvest when frankly you probably should be focusing on drying your grain and getting it away to market rather than rushing around trying to tick a box to get a cover crop in. We get cover crop failures, we just put it back in on the next wet couple of weeks because there's always a wet couple of weeks at some point uh, and if I was a betting man, it's usually mid-August, isn't it, in this country? Uh, it's lovely in September, just after you've dried the last grain. Um, cynicism's not healthy, but it's just true, isn't it? So, um, and yeah, Tom, Tom, who did this film, is rather obsessed with his owls, so you're seeing quite a lot of owl footage. And, and again, we just haven't got quite enough footage yet to make a proper film. Uh, we're working on it. Um, so I'll just leave that on in the background, but actually, it's nice to interact. I, I'm not a big fan of lecturing, so if anyone's got any questions for Tim or I about how you make that transition and journey, we'll try and be as open as possible without giving away too many state secrets about how you can add bits so that when the BPS is gone, you'll be fine. And that's how I'm feeling. We, we can make it to 2028. Yes. So, 90% um, of the land area is in a mid-tier scheme. So, we're doing two and a half years of legume fallow, which I then leave as a cover crop, uh, rather than destroy it and grow a cover crop in order to then grow spring barley. We then use low-input cereal, AB14, so I get paid 200 and something before I even go to work. And then we get £114 for a cover crop after that. Um, and we just keep that going. That rotation is continuous. So, so there's somebody backing my every risk I take all the time. Um, and as you know, we've had some terrible weather the last couple of years, haven't we? But you go, well, it isn't affecting me. Because I'm no longer at the mercy of, oh, no, it's too wet to get out and get that wheat in. And, or, it's, or it's too dry now and it's cracking. We're breaking that cycle, and that, frankly, is just pure profit. It is pure profit, and it, it's about just trying to be a little bit more intelligent about how you do it. It's weird, because when we first put the, half, the farm down to half fallow, everyone was still doing autumn drilling, and I just felt like a bit of a lost soul, but... Did you get a lot of comments from your neighbours? Horrible comments, yeah, but they, they can't say it to your face, can they? You know, it's, it's the looks you get, the comments. But the accusations that I've rewilded the farm... I mean, my landlords, only two weeks ago, were invited to the farm to reassure them, because they're farmers, that I am not rewilding a single hectare of this land, but I'm still delivering all the good stuff you've been listening about, biodiversity, carbon lockdown, nitrogen reduction, um, cutting my costs because it's all about my margin. I know I'm not telling you my margin, but it's a lot better than it used to be, per hectare, per annum. And I can forecast what I'm going to earn next year. If you can do that in arable farming rotation, you're a genius, because I can't do that, because it's a gamble. Uh, and they know we're taking a gamble and adjust the price accordingly. Um, yeah. Yes, indeed. So on the 1st of January 2018, half of, nine, half of the 90% of the farm was put into a grass legume fallow. Red clover, vetch, grasses, and a bit of trefoil. And for two and a half years, it stayed in that mix. This spring, that was destroyed, as you saw on the video. And those fields went into a spring barley for malting. I'm still trying to grow top quality malting, it, but if it fails and makes feed or under yields by a couple of tonnes per hectare, it's not the end of the world anymore, whereas in the past, if I couldn't hit seven tonnes of malting barley, you're starting to lose income. Um, then we grow a cover crop, relayed in, then we grow another spring barley, or I could grow spring wheat or uh, canary seed we grow a bit of for premium crops. Again, wild bird food's more valuable than human food. Um, 
And then I'm hoping we can get another five-year scheme from the government and do it for five more years. But that's then 10 years of carbon lockdown. And there's all loads of chat on carbon at the moment, but if you don't do it for 10 years without deep tillage, you're not going to maximise your carbon lockdown. So that's another little tick in the box that two years ago I wasn't even interested in carbon. So you suddenly starting to build build these things up, all these little bits add up, and guess what? Um, it, it's, I can pay my rent and carry on farming. Are you doing anything with the cover crop, like raising it? No, so we had a dairy. We were a mixed farm until 1999. And then the bank managers told everyone to specialise. So we, we share farmed, and we shared the combine and stuff with our big arable neighbour. Um, while I was away, Dad did that. It was quite efficient. Um, and then he kept a few beef. So where I've got the sort of fields that are quite hard to arable crop, he'd have a bit of beef um, that he would just have as stores. So he wouldn't fatten them, he, he wouldn't wean them. He'd, they're just there for stores. It gave our employee at the time a bit of winter work. Um, they're now gone. Uh, when I joined the environment scheme, I um, worked with my neighbour, who's a small dairy farmer. He farms everybody's bits of land they don't want. I have a lot of respect for him. So we did bed and breakfast for him. Um, so we'd be taking grass out of the cherry orchards, uh, feeding his cattle up and um, providing him a bit of straw and closing that loop and returning the muck back to the farm. Um, so there is a place for livestock. I can't use livestock because DEFRA, in their wisdom, have written this guide, and if you deviate from it, I won't get paid. So livestock don't currently fit. They need to fit. And the amount of local Dorset sheep farmers and organic dairy farmers knocking on the door asking for what I consider to be green compost growing uh, is amazing. And, and it feels bad that I can't share that with them, but the scheme says no. So I really hope the scheme in 2024 is a little more fluid than it currently is. I, th I think it's so prescriptive it puts so many people off maybe engaging in something that was actually designed by agronomists and farmers for farmers. Okay. I want to have a guess. Are you in a nitrate leaching zone and you're running for water? <coughs> in getting that support money from, from the water authority, would it change what your options might be within one of the schemes? Yes, that's correct. Um, I, I don't know whether I'm lucky or unlucky as a farmer in that where I sit is in a very political place. You know, the water company, we, we take our own water from the borehole under the farm too. But the water company down the road are taking a lot of water out. Uh, and we all know you can survive a few days without water, but a few months without food. So actually, I consider that as a public good, good drinking water is probably more important than good food in a short-term survival. Well, certainly if you ever did a survival course, that is true and it's more important than shelter and energy and everything else. But none of, this is, none, none of this is compulsory. I chose to engage with the water company because they didn't knock on the door like the environment agency and demand me to shut down. But they work with farmers, and some, some farmers choose not to engage with them because they want to be intensive, and some engage quite a lot more engage. I'll, I'll let you continue on. Yeah, we, we don't have a blueprint that uh, we're saying every farmer in a high nitrate catchment should be doing what John's doing. We'll work with the system that the farmer wants to pursue, um, and every farm's different. So we're fortunate in that we've got quite a lot of flexibility with our budgets. Um, in John's case, uh, countryside stewardship is the bulk of his uh, non-crop uh, sales income, and so the Wessex Water Funding is just topping up uh, those things. Uh, but in other catchments, we'll fund f farmers to grow cover crops if, for whatever reason, they're not getting that funding through countryside stewardship. Um, but, yeah, it's not all uh, plain sailing. You know, what John's doing with the legume fallow is a risk to us in that um, he's accumulating nitrogen uh, through the legumes over that two-year period he has to have it in the ground. Um, and so one of the really interesting things that we were watching for this winter, which was the first winter uh, uh, after the legume fallow needed to come out, uh, was what the nitrate leaching would be. But we've worked with John to uh, 
have a plan on how those legume fallows are destroyed and transitioned into the spring cropping. Um, and the first winter's results have been encouraging. Um, but so much of nitrate leaching does seem to come down to how much winter rainfall you do get. Uh, and so that's why we talk about rotational averages. And just to answer your question, do you think the price of nitrogen at the moment is good? If I don't have to buy it, I'm not... I'm completely, I'm completely with you. I've, I've been to a number of events where, with some water from the South East water where they're targeting the South Downs and there's big money for protecting the Africans. But I'm just a few miles north of that and I've got no access to any of it. And the target, the target that's within some of these prescriptions is really damn unfair that we're not being yeah. treated as a level playing field. So if anyone from the government's listening, I think you reflect that. If they're going to take our basic payment away, then everyone deserves to be paid for clean water, not just those of us in zones. Uh, in return, you know, I, I think that is a public good that everyone should have access to um, because it can be quite profitable too. It, it can really add value. Your two-year you mentioned you don't have it. No. It's really difficult to look at those thistles popping up, yeah. So I did a tiny bit of law in my degree. And if you read law, the best thing they ever teach you is the difference between might, may, will, shall, should, could. So if you just read it verbatim, oh yeah, the government is telling me I must do this. Actually, it's, we advise you to do, you will do certain things, but it is advisory, the other things you do. And so in a way, it's a gray area. Um, they're saying to you, in our experience, from the four agronomists who told us to set this up, we reckon you could top it continuously in year one. But it says you may, it doesn't say you must. So if you go, well, actually, I'm not going to do that because I'm going to kill all those nesting birds, or, or I don't want to top it, I want to let the thistles come up and flower and then roll them, I don't have a thistle problem, then you're never going to be able to ring them up at DEFRA and they'll go, yeah, yeah, you can do that. But they also have absolutely no way they can fine you for choosing that way of managing your, your um, system. But the caveat is, if it says you shall not or you will not, you will not. And, and you can't expect to be paid if you do. So these porous pots that I've described are small ceramic cups that we put 90 centimetres down in the ground and then we sample them every week or two between October and April and we then send that off to the Wessex Water Lab. That tells us what the nitrate concentration was in that uh, leachate and then we run it through uh, a, a model that converts it into kilos of nitrogen per hectare based on what the winter rainfall has been and based on the soil type and crop cover, etc. So uh, that gives us pretty good results, uh, so we know what's leached. Um, the, the, so your question about how do we know what's historic and what's current, uh, we don't exactly, um, but the hydrogeologists um, tell us uh, that based on their understanding of the water and chalk uh, and the processes, um, you've got this slow uh, trickle-down effect. The chalk is like a sponge and the water, uh, the, the water table it, it, it rises up and down, um, but the, water, the rainfall gently makes its way down through, except during periods of very heavy winter rainfall, it can bypass those normal pores in the chalk. And then that's one of the reasons why we see these spikes in the winter after rainfall, because uh, you've had a 
bit of a flush down through the, the fractures in the chalk. Um, but I'm not a hydrogeologist, so I, I can't sort of explain uh, the, the finer details on it. But yeah, if the, if the water table is 20 meters down and it's moved down through at one meter a year, then that, that nitrate could be 20 years old. So, so my grandfather chucked on the bag M at great big rates and so did dad. Uh, and, and I would have continued doing the same had someone not approached me to stop. So there's about 60, 70 years of potential future pollution ahead of us. Hopefully it gets diluted with time. But it's about just stopping that from continuing. And, and actually, why flush? Oh, different levels, but 50% of what I've had to pay for fertilizer down the drain. Um, the reason why is it, we're on such thin soils over, over chalk that the minute that nitrogen gets away from my rooting system, especially, you know, shallow rooting barleys, it's lost. Um, if you chuck a perennial in, you might mine down and get a metre or two deep and pull it back up. That's why lucerne's so cool, because my cousin grows lucerne and he's remining stuff that was out of reach. And suddenly he's pulled it back to the surface and he's got another crop on their very thin chalks for another four or five years. Um, it's quite noddy, but it works. Um, but, but it... You know, it's desperately expensive as it is nitrogen at the moment. So to know you're losing 50% of it before it even gets unloaded off the lorry is, yeah, I'd rather not lose it. I want 100% efficiency, which obviously will never happen, but it, it feels good. Can I ask a follow-up in terms of nitrate? Obviously, you talked about getting down to about 15 kilograms per hectare as the kind of acceptable level. Yeah. Is that typical... Or is that still, what would be ideal, or what would be kind of, for want of a better word, natural? Mm. Would there always be, because nitrogen is always going to get fixed by certain plants, so is there always going to be some nitrate loss, and is that acceptable, or would ideally it be zero? Well, the nitrogen cycle is very complex and very dynamic and of course it's not just all about water quality either you've got the atmospheric losses uh, in the form of ammonia and uh, nitrous oxide etc as well you need to consider um, natural levels of nitrate leaching would be under five kilos um, in Pool Harbour you've got a bit of natural input of nitrogen coming in from the sea um, but uh, yeah the, 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 it would be a neg negligible amount um, so the, yeah, the Environment Agency target for Pool Harbour, like I said, is about 18 kilos if you average out um, all your crops and all your land uses. So someone with a bit of woodland probably has an advantage over someone without. Uh, but we're just sort of feeling our way in terms of how establishing the, the rules for which you have to calculate your nitrogen loss baseline. But the good thing about what the NFU are doing is that that's on a voluntary basis at the moment rather than it being imposed upon the farmers as a uh, as leg as legislative response so, so just to explain 200,000 hectares of south dorset feeds in to pool harbor uh, and defra are treating it as a test and trial which they'll probably roll out what they learn from it to the other parts of the country where there's a, a nitrogen issue and they could well then do a phosphate issue and so everyone's ultimately going to be sucked into this. Um, and there's quite a few farmers who are really struggling to get their heads around it in South Dorset about why. But, but the answer is the alternative is to stop all form of farming immediately. And that includes organic farming, because even with a plow, you will release N into, or you'll have more cow muck that will go through the system. So don't... It's not even the solution is turn all of South Dorset organic or make it into a national park. The issue is efficiency and being really efficient with the use of it. Or if you want to be mega high input, then someone else somewhere else has to offset that. And that's, I think, quite a good way of doing it. It gives you the choice still. So John may be in a position uh, where he can sell nitrogen credits to farmers that aren't able to reach that environment agency target. Um, I'm not certain that we'll get to that point. Um, there's still a lot of water to flow under the bridge with the initial stages of, of the project, but uh, 
yeah, there will be some farmers who have more intensive business models who you know, do everything they can uh, and, and make progress towards the target but can't. And so the, the, we're going to need farmers like John who can uh, hit the target and go beyond in order to generate nitrogen credits. Well, this is the this is the big question, and it's you know, then you get. A no, but you, you're then into the same discussions as trading of carbon credits. Um, uh, so, yeah, I I see. It could potentially, but then that's where we will need the good. Uh, methods of calculating it because if a farmer is ever going to write out a check to John to buy his nitrogen credits they need to know that the method they've been uh, calculated is robust and, and that it's verifiable um, but I, I would sorry I would also hope that that farmer therefore gets paid more for his food because his cost has gone up so he's a winner too in that the member of the public is just going to have to pay more for that highly intensive type of farming you know you can't all grow no-till vegetables and spuds. You can, but to feed our population, it's really hard for those guys not to be polluting in some way. No, but let's hope it, the market will lift in order to allow for that, I think. And then the public will ultimately have to pay for it, a little more for their food, I would hope. Or should sure. we just keep it cheap and stack it high? I mean, uh, yeah. That's amazing. Oh, sorry. Did you say you use some of your own seed? Right? Was that some of the common ones? Um, yeah, I grow a bit of mustard, and um, I home save that. Uh, and I, I'm not going into a discussion on which cover crop to grow, but it works for me. Uh, and it, if I spin it on and it fails, it generally means I can afford to spin it on again, and it can fail, and I can spin it on again, and it will grow, and I will tick the box and lock, lock up that nitrogen. But also I see some of those weeds as cover crops too, so I might let the grass chit um, and become the cover crop. I'll, I'll let um, tailings of the odd, odd bit of barley that gets beyond me in the combine, just let it go and, and be part of that. Um, I think you've got, you've got something green growing, that's a cover crop, and everyone can get really hooked up on the best cover crops. I actually think probably the best one is probably maize, but we don't live in a... Uh, an environment where that is an option. Um, but yeah, the bigger it is, the more biomass it locks, the better. But at a price, you know, why should it cost you twice as much to establish as you're getting paid for it? Um, you're doing a public good. It's not always something you necessarily want to do. And bare overwinter stubbles were far easier to manage in the old days. So, um, yeah. John, it's half past five. We should probably think about wrapping things up but are, are there any more questions before we finish no? well thank, thank you very much. thanks for staying on guys yeah